to welcome everyone to today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, Family Partners is so happy to have you at our table on today, Thursday, July 9th. I am um, going to remind folks that our format is casual. We are pleased to be having um, lunch with an expert. This is what we offer. Lunch and Learn is lunch with an expert for us to hear things from their perspective, to learn about programs and services, and to help us all um, you know, fortify our bellies, maybe if you're enjoying a sandwich, but also to learn more about how we, what we can do to help youth in our community, what we can do to help the community in general. And today um, is no different. Today we are uh, lucky enough to have Dr. Davis with us. Um, so I will encourage you to use the chat function if you have a question, if you have um, a comment that you would like to make. And Dr. Davis has been very generous with us that he will he will speak for a while and then stop for questions and answers. But if there's something that you really would like to um, you know, share on the moment, put it in the chat and we will help you out with that. So um, we are recording this for uh, the sake of you folks being able to review it and share it. So you don't have to write frantically. We are, uh, we'll share this recording with you following the presentation. And um, Dr. Davis, I want to, I have to read like some of your background. I'm very impressed with, with uh, your experience. May I, may I praise on? Let's see here. Absolutely. So uh, most of you I'm sure know Dr. Davis, but he is a retired police sergeant, um, author of a few publications, one including Black Cops Against Brutality, A Crisis Action Plan. Um, and when I look at the degrees you have, I mean, I love, you know, um, BA in English, Master's of Public Administration, Master's of Administrative Science, Master's in Public Administration and Urban Education Leadership. And uh, I love also that uh, you have appeared on a lot of things greater than our little Lunch and Learn program, uh, you're including MTV, Nightline, C-SPAN, Oprah, uh, popular guest on radio talk shows. So it is an honor to have you with us because when I look at all of your um, many qualifications. I, I appreciate the fact that you were also executive director um, of Essex County uh, Family Support Organization, which is one of Union 15 County. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Union County. Union, you like that? I have Essex in there. So all right, I was on a roll. <laughs> I, Carol tried to help me. She was shaking her head frantically. But I love that you are in also in the business of family support organizations, recognizing that families need our support and they need our advocacy and they also need education and, and lifting up. And I always say um, that we're kind of in the business of starting awkward conversations, you know, things that are happening in people's lives that are not easy to, to handle. And um, I think our topic today speaks to that. So I am um, very eager to hear what you have to say. And I know that it's also going to be said with um, positivity and uplifting and support to help us all deal with what's happening in our world, uh, dealing with the traumatic effects of racial and regional inequalities. So I will stop chattering and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. DeLacy. Like I said, he plans to speak uh, for a while and then have questions and answers. If you have anything else in the meantime, please feel free to use the chat. So Dr. Davis, it's all, the floor is yours. Thank you, Holly, I appreciate it. And I certainly appreciate your executive director, your organization. Um, we are colleagues, um, family partners of Morris and Sussex. Um, we're colleagues of 15 FSOs across the state of New Jersey, and we do this work, I think, uniquely. For those who may not know, we all have special needs children, which is a requirement for most of the positions in this organization. Uh, I am a single dad, have been a single dad. My mom, when she was living, helped me raise um, children that I was bringing home. I have one birth child with four adopted children and two of them who came up through the system, one diagnosed bipolar schizoaffective and the other oppositionally defiant. When I met them at different times in my law enforcement career, they were between the ages of 12 and 16. And three girls, one boy, the youngest child is now 33, the oldest is 37. Mm -hmm. And my birth child just turned 29 on the 28th of June. So there you have it. And you know, I thought I'd be done doing this kind of work in terms of children, but I'm still getting more. So what I'd like to do, and thank you for the introduction, um, because it's a lunch period, I wanna to try to get through about 20 to 30 minutes of a presentation. Um, we'll stop in between as we need to, and I'll be guided by my host in terms of where to stop, what they'll make a decision based on what's in the chat, because I won't be reading that because I'm trying to stay within the time frame, of course, which is always a challenge. Um, and essentially, we're gonna talk about race um, racism and what's, what it looks like here and around the region and, and, and the inequities 
but also it's an opportunity to engage people. You know, it's an opportunity for us to create a safe space where people can simply exchange ideas. Uh, what I want to say, in, in honestly, as I say in union, often we have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, this topic is always uncomfortable in this country because it's never been honestly, in my opinion, and accurately dealt with. Um, most recently, I did my research. My dissertation was on police use of force, examining the factors relating to police officers shooting unarmed black males. And I was looking for implicit bias. And of course, we found implicit bias. We did 120 observations looking at 30 police officers in a video simulator. And I was measuring their reaction time and error rate to see if, in fact, they shot black or brown suspects quicker than white suspects. And so we had four scenarios, two with white suspects, two with black suspects. We were looking for them to shoot the unarmed black suspect. Only one out of 30 shot him. But they did shoot the black male much quicker than they shot the white female who had a gun and had shot the person in front of them. They still were trying to talk the gun out of her hand. In fact, they shot the black male in 0.51 seconds. They did shoot the white male that was a suspect in 0.25 seconds, which would neutralize some of the implicit bias. But the white female, when we compared the black male suspect scenario to the white female scenario, where she shot her ex-husband while holding a baby and still shooting, um, they were trying to talk the gun out of her hand and it took them 7.35 seconds to shoot her and they should have shot her as quickly as they shot the other two suspects. So that lets us know the biases there. And we all have bias, um, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. So having said that, um, you know, we want to get into it. I know people have been looking at George Floyd, and certainly that is where we're going to land at the end of this piece. Because as family support partners, and me as an executive director who's also certified as the partner, what happens is how do you go into the household and talk to a family and talk about providing services when all over TV for the last six to eight weeks, they've seen the country burning, they've seen protests, we've seen demonstrations, we have seen a man killed on TV under the knee of another man. And these are modern day lynches and this lynchings and this causes trauma for people who are either witnessing it, who are related to it, or having the story related to them. And so we can pretend that we don't see it or we can talk past it or we can ask a family how you're doing in terms of their child and their special need or circumstance. But the social reality is I am traumatized by what I'm seeing on every news channel. What I'm hearing about, it's all over social media. And even for my white brothers and sisters, the question for some of them is, in the protest, what you've been seeing is people saying white silence is white violence. So how does that get processed? And so I'm going to agencies now where the environment is predominantly white, but they're servicing families that are predominantly black and brown, and they don't even know how to begin the discussion. And so we're having those kinds of conversations um, because what happens to the white person that wants to ask questions, but doesn't want to ask the wrong question. And so you've been working in an environment where you've asked 99 questions or 100 questions. 99 have been appropriate, culturally competent. They've been sensitive. But you ask the 100th question that even to you later, in retrospect, sounds so foolish and silly, and people vamp on you. And what happens to the black and brown person who's been under this pressure all the time, and they're waiting for you to make a mistake because they want a boogeyman. So in a polarized society, we've got to figure out how do we have this discussion. And so what I want to do is give it some historical context. I want to define some things operationally. Most of my research is coming from Dr. Joy DeGruy's research. Um, she's the author of Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Um, and her most recent addition to the book is Let the Healing Begin. So I don't want you to think that I'm going to give you all these challenges and not give you some solutions. So I'm going to give you some of the solutions that she recommends in her circle and some of the solutions that we recommend that we use. And then we'll talk about it because you probably will have better solutions than me. Having said that, I'm going to get started. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. If we have any problems, please just raise a hand or yell and my host will tell me what I need to do next. But right now we're hoping that everything goes like we planned. So let's try. There we go. Let's share that screen and let's get started. And so you see the title and we talk about it, um, how to support youth facing trauma, the effects of racial regional inequities, George Floyd and beyond. Gave you a little bit of music. That's all you're going to get. Let me move on, right? And so, you know, you've heard some of my credentials. I come from Drew University, Fairly Dickinson University, Rutgers, St. John Fisher recently in my dissertation. Sankofa, and I start with Sankofa 
Um, and I, while I can't see you, I'll just assume and I'll ask if you were in front of me, do you know what Sankofa means? And maybe one or two people might raise their hand, but many will not. Sankofa means go back and fetch. It means return to the source, that we cannot go forward as a collective African people until we go back to the source, to the beginning. And so you'll see me do some of this because what we also try to do in union is model the behavior that we would like staff and folks that are working in our community to carry out. And so my family history, the Dave Taylor Johnson Davis tree, I am the fifth generation of my family. We begin with Professor Gable Day, as you see in 1818 to 1895 in Loudoun County, Virginia. And the fact that he was called professor during a time of slavery indicates that he could read and write. So he was named Gable Day. And the reason I know this much of the history because I have the family Bible. So what you also would need to know is that during that time, we didn't necessarily have a census and we didn't have someone recording birth certificates. And so for many black families and those who were and had been enslaved, when a child was born, they used the family Bible to record the birth and the death of the family. So I have one half of the family tree for five generations and another cousin on the other side has the other half of the tree. And I want to talk about very quickly the history of policing. Let me move this thing out of my way because I can't see. Look, look, here we go. We're going to see if I can get this out of my way. And I can't. So can, I'm going to read what I can see because I'm going to have to ask someone else to read. But the genesis of modern policing organizations in the South was the slave patrols. And the first formal patrols were created in the Carolinas in the colonies, right? Slave patrols had three functions to chase down, apprehend, and return to the owners, the runaway slave and to provide a formal organized terror organization to deter slave revolt and to maintain a form of discipline. Okay, give me one second, because I got to move this out of my way so I can read, there we go. That's much better. Right, to maintain a form of discipline for slave workers who were subject to summary justice outside of the law if they violated any plantation rules. And I want you to understand that what that means is that if a white person saw an enslaved person violating the rules outside the plantation, they were deputized to actually enforce discipline on the spot, up to including killing the slave. Following the Civil War, these vigilante style organizations evolved into modern Southern police departments, primarily as a means of controlling free slaves who were now laborers working in an agricultural caste system and enforcing Jim Crow segregation laws designed to deny free slaves equal rights and access to the political system. So you would ask, and most people have asked, certainly for me as a black police officer of 20 years, why would you become a police officer, DeLacy? The answer is very quickly right there at the top, to pursue my music career. I was a musician and I simply wanted to finance my music career. And so I figured I'd become a police officer. It was a solid check and I could do that. And I've done that, been all over the world. I also wanted to buy real estate. So by the time I retired, I bought four houses. But while doing that work, I fell in love with African people. And I say African people, that includes Caucasian people, although I won't do it in this lecture. Lucy's the first mother, and they determined that she's the first mother discovered to be some 1.5 million years old. And that means everyone who descends from Lucy in Ethiopia is an African, including our Caucasian brothers and sisters. And if you go to South Africa, where I've been, you will meet Africans who have melanin in their skin like me, but they got blonde hair, blue eyes, and consider themselves to be Black Africans. And so I joined the East Orange Kinsman, which is a Black police officer organization when I joined the force, Sergeant Irv Children who went on to become a reverend before his passing, actually created a pathway for me. I joined the National Black Police Association, which was the first national black police organization founded in 1972 to address inequities in terms of law enforcement inside and outside of the black community. And then in New Jersey, we had the New Jersey Council of Black Police Association. And in 1991, while on the police force, I founded Black Cops Against Police Brutality. These are some of the activities. I won't go into all of them. Lionel Tate is one of the cases that we're pop that's very popular. He's the youngest person in the history of the United States to, to be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I didn't know the family, didn't know him. I was reached out to while on the police force, flew to Florida. We spent three years flying back and forth to advocate on his behalf. We were able to go to Rome, Italy with 33 parents from under our wings delegation. We fought on Lionel's behalf and other, other parents, the Pope, we had an opportunity to meet with Pope John Paul II to have access to Vatican Radio. Three years later, Johnny Cochran took the place, took the case, and um, Grant Long, who was playing for the NBA team Grizzlies at the time, um, gave us a check for $50,000, which covered the appeal, and we walked Lionel out of jail in 2004. And these are some of the other cases, and again, we'll share some of this with you. Um, so the price paid for social justice, and as, as FSOs, we advocate because we have young people also juvenile justice system involved. And so the price that you pay when you step up like this is that one, 
you got relationships that suffer. And my relationships absolutely have suffered. And so do families. And I want us to understand that because when we're going to service families and we're wondering why they're not fully engaged, because there may be some pain going on in and around the family. The family suffers, right? It's traumatic for many people, whether it's something they experienced, something they observed, or something they heard about, whether it's primary trauma, secondary trauma, or tertiary trauma, it's still trauma and it impacts and affects the family making the decision to testify against brutal police officers. And that was something I had to do. And that cost me relationships. There's isolation that goes on. Even now during the pandemic, people are feeling isolated and people are feeling traumatized. And you know, I've had friends who are calling and needing some guidance around how do I keep my head together under these circumstances? Because as humans, we, we're prepared and we're developed to engage with people. There's a loss of friendships for taking a position and a stance on social justice, loss of employment, and then the trauma of being a black man and a police officer in a blue uniform, that's traumatic. So we want to define what is trauma, right? It can be a single event, more often multiple events over time, complex or prolonged trauma. It can be caused by interpersonal violence or violation. It could be disaster like a hurricane, natural disaster or human disaster. That's possible, right? And, and why is it important to understand? Because one, it helps us to know more. Trauma can be pervasive. The impact is broad, deep, and life-shaping. So I mentioned some of the children that I have. So one of my daughters was violently molested by a birth father. As a result, um, she acted out sexually. She was only four years old when it occurred. So that trauma would cause her to misbehave often. And because no one necessarily drilled down to figure out what that was, when she was confronted and that fight or flight kicked in, she punched you dead in the face. It didn't matter that she was a size four and a little tiny thing. She would fight because she was fighting things that were that had occurred earlier in her life that she could not verbalize, but now she was acting out. So it has a broad impact impact deep and life shaping um, trauma's impact especially interpersonal violence is often self-perpetuated as we just talked about and it's differentially affects the more vulnerable so what is trauma specific care trauma recovery it promotes healing it teaches skills and psycho empowerment mind body and other modalities so with one of my young people i have another one that's oppositionally defiant and again traumatized similarly like my other daughter and she would just fight or throw herself down a flight of stairs one or the other and so we had to learn the skills to work with her and to help her she's now 35 years old but still traumatized and so there are times when myself and some even some of my staff at the fso we have to reach out because we see her screaming loud and clear on facebook or other social media bias and i'm going to run through kind of quickly explicit bias right in the case of explicit or conscious bias the person's very clear about his or her feelings and attitudes and related behaviors are conducted with intent and this type of bias is processed neurologically at a conscious level as declarative semantic memory and in words conscious bias is in ex it's extreme is characterized by overt negative behavior that can be expressed through physical and verbal harassment or through more subtle means such as exclusion. And I just talked about some of that isolation, right? Implicit bias, which I studied for my research, implicit bias or unconscious bias operates outside of the person's awareness and can be in direct contradiction to the person's espoused beliefs and values. What is so dangerous about implicit bias is that it automatically seeps into a person's affect or behavior and it is outside of the full awareness of that person. Implicit bias can interfere with clinical assessment, decision making, and provide patient relationships such as the health goals that the provider and patient are seeking are compromised. So the United States Constitution was the first contradiction and resulting cognitive dissonance. And for those that would ask, so what is cognitive dissonance? It's the anxiety that results from simultaneously holding or otherwise incompatible attitudes and beliefs. And so freedom and democracy is articulated in the Constitution. It says, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. But it didn't include the natives, the indigenous people, and it didn't include African people. So you have the genocide of the natives, you have the Trail of Tears with the Cherokee people being wiped out nearly. You, you had um, agreements between the United States government and natives and you saw them violated time and time again. You had them put on reservation. And then we saw African people reduced to chattel slavery. 
And so the question becomes, how does America resolve the cognitive dissonance? Because clearly that is not consistent with the articulation in the Constitution of freedom and democracy. Well, one, you justify the behavior, or two, you relabel people to fit the behavior. And so Blacks were defined in a way that made chattel slavery reasonable and justified to the country. And as my grandmother, who was born in 1901 and died 1982, would tell us she was the youngest of 10 children and all her aunts and uncles were slaves, that people would ask them, did she have a tail? And they would tell them that they were not as smart as other people. And they would do all sorts of things to justify the mistreatment. Which takes me to a recent interview that I observed on Channel 2, CBS News, and Robert Gates, who was a former Secretary of Defense, but he's also a CIA, CIA director. He also was um, 26 years in the CIA and president of Texas A&M from 2002 to 2006. And interestingly enough, he was um, the Secretary of Defense under President George W. Bush. He was retained by President Barack Obama, and he was the CIA director under President George H.W. Bush. So that's the mouthful. And this is what he said on the interview a few weeks ago. And they would ask him about this protest in the street and George Floyd, and is this a turning point for him? Because they were saying it was a turning point for the United States, as evidenced by the presentation we're having. And this is what he said, and I quote, I think what many of us missed, and I feel like I've been an inclusive leader in the organizations that I've led, recent events have been a turning point in the attitudes of a lot of people. But I don't think that many of us fully appreciated the day-to-day -day kinds of humiliations and difficulties that African-Americans, even the most successful African-Americans have had to deal with. I think that that's really come to the fore in the last two or three weeks in a way that for many of us had not been particularly evident before that. And so the picture that you see here is a picture that's behind me in my dining room. And it's done by a artist here in America, in, the United, in New Jersey called um, Baja Ugueli. And that picture is called Ahmed. It's an acronym for American education. And I will read from the certificate. The certificate says Ahmed, Arabic name meaning highly praised, conceptualized as an abbreviated acronym which stands for American education. Through institutionalized racism within education in America, we are trained to denounce our indigenous cultures, ideologies, and spirituality to adopt colonialism and Western idealism all in the name of being, quote, highly praised, end quote, through the process of assimilation. And so this was an original painting that was created April 6, 2012. And then finally, most recently, there was an article that was done in CNN.com, and I was interviewed for it. And the question was, what's it like to be a Black police officer navigating two turbulent worlds? And that's the article that you can reach out and get. And so it says, the Lacey Davis remembers the moment vividly. The New Jersey officer and a fellow officer were patrolling the streets of East Orange when a black woman and her daughter accidentally stepped in front of their police cruiser. The other officer who was white rolled down his window, quote, what the hell are you doing, you effing ends? End quote. Davis recalled him saying while censoring out the racial slur. Davis, who was black, is now retired from the force. But that moment 30 something years ago was just one of the many times he realized how some of his white colleagues viewed his community. Quote, the few bad apples theory is a theory that I think is postulated by my colleagues and politicians to minimize the impact of this racism that is baked into the culture of policing, end quote, David said. That's George Floyd under the knee of Sergeant Chauvin, who's got his hand in his pocket as though he's just, just a walk through the park, the Minneapolis police. And this is what the aftermath looked like. protests, police cars being burned. And so we think about that just by itself, and we wonder about mental wellness of people, right? How do we work with our families knowing and seeing that? And so some of people are going to, you're going to see post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's a disorder that develops in some people who've experienced a shocking, scary, or dangerous event. That picture I just showed you of Mr. Floyd would fit that description. It is natural to feel afraid during and after a traumatic situation. Fear triggers many split-second changes in the body to help defend against danger or to avoid it. This fight-or-flight response is a typical reaction meant to protect a person from harm. Nearly everyone will experience a range of reactions after trauma, yet most people recover from initial symptoms naturally. Those who continue to experience problems may be diagnosed with PTSD. 
People who have PTSD may feel stressed or frightened even when they're not in danger. Can you imagine what the 17 year old young lady who filmed that killing of George Floyd must be going through? And the death threats that she's now begun to receive from people who know that she recorded it. And the fact that even when the other officers were telling them to move away and get away, she stayed there with the camera rolling while people were screaming around her. Signs and symptoms. Not every traumatized person develops ongoing chronic or even short term acute PTSD. Not everyone with PTSD has been through a dangerous event. Some experiences like the sudden unexpected death of a loved one can also cause PTSD. Symptoms usually begin early within three months of the traumatic incident, but sometimes they begin years afterwards. Symptoms may, may last or must last more than a month and be severe enough to interfere with relationships or work to be considered PTSD. The course of the illness varies. Some people recover within six months while others have symptoms that last much longer. In some people, the condition becomes chronic. A doctor who has experience helping people with mental illness, such as a psychiatrist or psychologist, can di help diagnose PTSD. So let the healing begin. Dr. Joy DeGruy, who a lot of the research I've used today, talks about creating healing circles in and around the community, right? So this is also some of the solutions that we can have to what's going on in and around our community. How do we create a healing circle so that people are able to express themselves like we're doing today? And so we might consider having a talking stick in the healing circle. So whoever has the stick gets to talk. In our YP, we would consider having one mic. So if a young person wants to talk because they're used to dropping the mic, we will pass a mic or symbolically pass the mic and say one mic only, meaning one person talking at a time. But the person with the mic or the talking stick gets to express themselves. And also they get to pass. Maybe some people want to be there and they're not ready to talk yet. You know, in our world, and our work, we call it rolling with readiness. So if they're not ready, the fact that they're there at all says that they're trying to make baby steps toward getting ready and let them pass the mic. So we want to create safe spaces to bring men's groups together, right? I do something in East Orange called Donuts with Dad. I've been doing it 13 years. We're on a school day on a Thursday, the second Thursday of the month from nine to 10 o'clock. The PTA, they provide breakfast and the dads come in and I do a one hour workshop on a topic that they determined the year before. And we make sure that there's solutions at the end and there's some behaviors that they can replicate in the beginning. So every father that walks in, I embrace, shake a hand, give a hug, no matter how they're dressed, whether they're in a suit and tie or they have Tim's and a t-shirt, making sure that they feel welcome and that this is a safe space. Very often black and brown men and even poor men, white men and those from fragile communities do not come into the schools in the public school system because they don't feel welcomed in the system. And so we try to create that atmosphere and we've been very successful getting 50 to 75, 75 fathers every month for the last 13 years. We want to make sure that we acknowledge each other. Some of you that came on early saw me call you by name. Holly said, I want to make sure you know I'm going to greet everyone. And I understood that. But what I was doing was practicing my preach. Even though I expected that Holly would greet everyone, I also greeted everyone so that no one thought that there were going to be any big eyes and little eyes, right? We're all on the same team. And so everyone's equally important. So whether I knew you or not, what I attempted to do is build a relationship with you by calling you by your name, not by your agency and making sure that you understood that you were important to me in this space. We want to support each other as we're doing now. We're supporting our family partners here. We're, even though we're in union, we're still partners. We're still a part of the same team and it should look that way. And we want to defend each other. Right should be right. There isn't a right in Sussex, Morris Sussex that's different than the right in union. Right is right across the board. If you're right, you're right. If you're wrong, you're wrong. And then we build from there. And then finally, we can develop a clearinghouse or an institute on programs and resources for our community and for our people. Some of my solutions, one of them is let's listen, learn, and love. Let's learn to listen to other people, particularly views that we don't hold. That's important, not because we want you to change your view or to be proselytized to, but so that you want to listen to hear what other people feel. Stephen Covey says in the seven habits of highly effective people, seek first to understand, then to be understood. When we go into households and we're preparing to do the family assessment of needs and strength, where we're working to identify strengths for the caregiver or the parent, we should be listening. There's a story that's being told and it's being told from multiple perspectives because there are multiple participants. So we must learn to listen, which is a skill. And then we want to learn from what we're listening to. We either learn that I don't agree with that 
And I don't ever want to hear that again. You might say, I hate Dr. Davis and everything he has to say, but I heard him. And then we want to love the process that gets us here. What is that? As I said earlier, to my, and I say it to my staff, we must learn to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Talking about race in this country is an uncomfortable conversation. It's not uncomfortable for me because grandma has always talked to me about race. Now, we talked about it from a perspective of being oppressed. We get to talk about it from coming from a fragile community. And now I get to talk about it as a subject matter expert in certain areas, not from a position of victimhood, but a position of there's some things that we all need to know. And this is foundational, which is why I started you with Sankofa. Many people have never heard Sankofa. There's the movie by Haley Garima. I strongly encourage that you get it. It's difficult to watch in the beginning, and it's a story about a black woman who's modeling and doing all the things that Europe says she should do and defined as being beautiful. And then she falls asleep at the Elmina Cape Coast Castle and she goes back centuries into slavery. And it brings her from there forward, helping her to understand that you must return to the source to move forward. We want to engage in communities relative to co-respondence to crises. They're now talking about redesigning police departments while they're also talking about um, defunding the police some people who define defunding mean it as a way of reallocating and reinvesting some of the budgets of the police departments. So they're looking at trauma teams and we need to consider participating as a member or being embedded in a local police department so that they have our perspective, our family's perspective and our children's perspective when they're designing um, their actions and their strategies in our communities. We wanna develop programs to help police and community, including our youth, process the pain of these killings. Let me say that again. We want to help to develop programs that help police and community, especially our youth, process the pain of these killings. I was brought in to do a session for the staff at Beth Israel Hospital last month. And the CEO, Mr. Daryl Terry, Darryl Terry, who's an African-American man, said the first time he went before his staff to talk about this subject, he couldn't do it. He broke down and had to leave the room. Because what I need folks who don't understand to try to understand is that this hurts. For me to see a black man under the knee of a police officer in a profession that I loved and I spent 20 years and I retired from, and it is totally inconsistent with everything I've ever learned, it also is traumatic for me and other men and other people of goodwill and of conscience because no one should have to die that way. And at the end of the day, a $20 counterfeit bill, the penalty is not the death penalty. If anything, it's a tap on the wrist. We want to develop interdisciplinary work groups to examine the reimagining of policing. Communities have a right to decide what policing looks like in their community. It's their tax dollars, right? No taxation without representation. And so communities should make that determination, not necessarily the police in a vacuum by themselves. And we want to host town hall meetings to discuss the pain, bring a friend and a colleague so that you can continue the dialogue afterwards. I also mentioned chew and chit chat and chew like you're doing now. This is a great way of learning where you can sit at your desk, you can sit in your home space, wherever you are for lunch and hear some things. Now you may only take one thing away that you like or agree with and that's fine, but at least you're giving yourself an opportunity to be exposed to information that you otherwise would not be exposed to. And then finally do something because these issues are not going to go away. So we have to do something. And so I wanted to make sure that I didn't just come and trigger folk and not give them solutions. And so National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a number here in email, as well as the National Domestic Violence Hotline, because people who are in the pandemic are locked in, those who are victims and stuck in with their abusers. And now we'll open this up for questions and answers. And I thank you very much. Now I'm ready for feedback. All I can say is, wow, that's my first, that's a lot of information. And I am gonna remind folks to please add your questions or comments in the, in the chat and we'll get, uh, we'll give you an opportunity to, to talk to Dr. Davis, but there's so much to learn. Mm. And you, I think I could have listened to you go through those slides in about a four hour period and still have questions because mm -hmm you know so much and i feel like speaking for myself and i'm happy to hear feedback from others um i have so much to learn and um i i'm looking here my chat is uh 
here we go. Let's see, wonderful presentation. Um, I love this. I absolutely loved every second of this presentation. Thank you so much. A question I have, I mean, you're, you're throwing out, I, I really, really appreciated, especially as a white person hearing the, I think there's a, such a, let me back up a second. I think in our community right now, in general, there is such a polarization that it's so hard to talk about anything without someone telling you you're wrong or that it's us versus them. And I'm talking political, I'm talking, it seems like in every, um, even though it's whether or not you wear a mask, right? We can't seem to agree on um, very many things. And I think I've heard young people um, feeling frustrated that if they're young white people and they don't know what to say, that like you were saying, the silence is violence. Like I had not heard that phrase before. Yes. But I really, I appreciated your saying that baby steps, you know, baby steps are steps. And I think um, the more we have these conversations, the more it allows us to ask questions and to better understand. I really, um, I appreciate that. But how do we, you laid out a lot of things really quickly. <laughs> so let me just interrupt for a minute. The Please. reason I did it in 30 minutes. So when I did it at Beth, they had about 300 people in, in the room and around the agency. I did it in 13 minutes because I wanted it done in 15 minutes because one of the things I want to be clear about, and my mentor, Dr. Howard Seeley, may God be pleased with him, used to teach me this when I was much younger. Never believe that people want to hear so much of what you have to say that you don't take time to hear what they have to say. And so I wanted to make sure that I left a lot of room on the other end for people to understand that I wanted to hear them. Usually when you have a speaker, even if they're an expert, if there's an hour, they're going to talk 59 minutes and tell you 50 people now you got 60 seconds to get your, th your question in so I kept it within that 30 minute window or 25 minute window so we could hear from you so that's why I want that, to that's great I'm going to share one of the questions with you uh Dr. Davis Melissa is asking us you know how would you recommend as a social worker or a community member to reach out to local police departments to start or to be a part of conversations I heard you say reach out to local, but you broke up. So I'm going to read I'm, through the. I think, yeah, please, if you yeah, can see it. it. How would you recommend as a social worker community to reach out to local police departments to start or to be part of conversations? So, you know, I, I'm almost going to tell you, and I know you answered, you asked the question sincerely, Melissa, but I'm going to be a little flip and say as a rhetorical question, right? Because you do exactly what you just asked me. You reach out, you pick up the phone, you say, if, it depends on where you are, because some places they won't give you access, but in the little towns, you can get to the police chief. And in the bigger towns, you can't get to the police chief, but maybe the police director, or maybe their community services department or community relations. Whatever point of contact, you reach out and you say, under these circumstances, and now with what's going on, what are you doing to engage the community more fully in terms of these issues? I'm a social worker, or I'm in a group of social workers, I'm in, I'm in a SW, or whatever your group is, and we're interested in working with you. Do you have a response team? Do you have a crisis response team? Um, how do you respond to crises in this particular community? And are you open to the idea of at least having a dialogue? Now, it really is that simple in many instances. And what I've been telling folks that are calling me now from all over the country is that um, this is a good time now to engage law enforcement because I don't think they'll ever open up their doors again like this for another 200 years because they don't usually want, because law enforcement is a closed shop. And, and I'll be honest, because I didn't talk much about policing in the North, because in the North, while the South was using them as slave patrollers, what was happening in the North, they were using them to bust unions. And they were using them to protect property and to make sure that political parties stayed in control. So the police department is a closed shop that usually doesn't like scrutiny or light on it. But in suburban communities, it, they police very differently in suburban America than they do in parts of rural America than they do in urban America. And then suburban urban America, which I describe as the places where they may have a lot, large populations of black and brown people, but it's very suburban, but they got urban crime and they're in denial. So what they begin to do is bring in what, what I consider to be predatory policing or militarized policing or over policing because you're black and brown and therefore you need this because you're not law abiding. And then there are some in, in the white community that will say, well, if they simply comply, nothing will go wrong. And that's just not the truth. Mm. Mm. So that's what I recommend, um, Melissa, in terms of engaging, that you start to go down the list and also identify the agencies that you've contacted and the people. 
and hold them accountable. And if they're extremely resistant in that police department, what I often tell people is, you don't have to worry about controlling the police if you control the people who control the police. They're an arm of government. And so at the end of the day, you hamstrung the mayor, the assembly people, the Congress people, and you say, hey, they're not engaging. You know, everyone is now toting community policing, which is one of my areas of expertise. Well, community policing is not a program, it's a philosophy. And it's supposed to be a department-wide philosophy with the hierarchy that we normally have in a police department is broken down and you allow the frontline officer to actually work collaboratively with the community to problem solve. And that's what's supposed to happen. It's usually somebody coming along with a program, spend a couple of dollars and call those the community police officers. No, it should be department-wide. You should be able to pick up the phone and ask any officer for guidance and direction. You should be able to stop any officer on the street and say, hey, I'm lost. Can you tell me how to get here? And if they can't tell you, they should be able to find the answer for you and give you something meaningful as opposed to brushing you off. Mm. So if we can franchise a burger at McDonald's, <laughs> if you eat a Big Mac in New Jersey, it tastes reasonably like the same Big Mac in California. But why does policing in urban America and rural America look so damn different from policing in suburban America where the, where the median income is $100,000 versus those where we have fragile communities and the median income may be $25,000 to $50,000? The burger didn't change, just the attitudes of the people, whether it's implicit or explicit bias. And we all have bias. Mm. We all have bias. I prefer Tom's toothpaste without fluoride over Crest. That's a bias. Mm. And if I had spent the night at your house and you didn't have Tom's, I wouldn't brush my teeth. That's also a problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to see it for what it really is. It's not to say that you're a bad person because you have a preference, but we have to be clear to check our bias at the door so that we're not mistreating other people who are different than us, who look different than us, who may behave differently, or may live differently than us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got another question? Well, that's, yeah, that's a big part, of course, of being a, a family support partner. I'm hoping you can hear me. I do. Okay. Is the, leaving the bias at the door, but I, at, I heard recently Brene Brown, I don't know if you follow her at all, a social scientist, I, I love her stuff, but she told a story of how she was a woman, she was a professor teaching women's studies. And she was on a plane and the co-pilot comes out of the plane and it was a woman and she was very pleased. And then the pilot came out and it was also a woman and she went into panic because she thought, how can two girls be flying this plane? And then she said, oh my gosh, you know, she had biases on gender, which she was, you know, carrying the torch for. And she said, you know, as a white person, that helps me understand that I have so many genders that I don't even realize I have until you're faced yes. with them. So that's one comment on my part, but I have to say to you, Dr. Davis, when I hear you tell the stories that you're telling and sharing the facts that you're sharing, I feel an energy coming from you of hope and positivity. Mm -hmm. And I think when I hear many others leading a conversation, it's more about being right. Well, that's you know what true. I'm saying? Yeah, that's, so I mean, I think that's my, personally, this, I think that's a big challenge in our communities that we are not you make me feel welcome to ask questions right. and and to seek and to learn and to with respect and I think um, I just think that's a big challenge in our communities in general and then now that we're so isolated it's hard for us to you know me sit across the table from you and feel that warm fuzzy you know feel that feeling of cooperation I mean what what, what can we do given the difficult climate? And I'm not just talking political, I'm talking COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm talking, you know, people are wrapped very tightly these days because there are so many challenges and so much uncertainty. So let me answer part of it a couple of different ways from a couple of different perspectives. The delay that you see today is the delay that has gone through three, four college degrees, mm -hmm. lots of pain and suffering, mm -hmm. lots of hurt, um, lots of counseling and lots of people of goodwill of many races and genders who've come along and said, we know that you mean well and we want to try to support you. Everyone hasn't had that opportunity. Right. And I'm mindful of that, right? Can you imagine, I remember, I, I was gonna say George Floyd, but let me take it away so we don't keep traumatizing people with that image. 
what Malik Jones was a young man in, in um, New Haven, Connecticut in 1997 or 98, um, April 14th, at the corner of Grand and Murphy at six o'clock PM, he was chased there from a police officer in East Haven, Connecticut, in a van that claimed it was a high speed chase. Well, you know, vans don't go but so fast. And he chased Malik and his friend to the corner of Grand and Murphy where they pulled into a lot and the cop jumped out of his car and the the window was open and he did what we tell all cops not to do. Don't stick your dumb hand in a moving vehicle. But he did, trying to turn the car off. And that didn't quite work. And how fast could the car have been going if he's running alongside of it, right? He's not a superhero. And there was a white cop, Floodquist, and Malik was driving and wrong. And eventually Malik put the car in reverse and Floodquist pulled his gun and shot him in the chest. And he said in his report, and I quote, because I read the, all the paperwork, the suspect gave me a defiant go to hell look, so I shot him several more times. Malik was shot 19 times. His mother's a lawyer. She protested at that corner. My staff and my team and some of my colleagues, we went up there every 14th of the month for four years to protest at the corner of Grant and Murphy. It took from then until this past January for New Haven, the city government, to pass a civilian review board law called the Malik Jones Law. Now, I say this to you, to say, to say that to you, to say this a part of your question. The first time his mother heard of me, she reached out to me. And me and Carol Russell, who's there, who's a retired sergeant from Trenton and former police director in Trenton, who's on this call, we went up to New Haven and we did what we call what to do and stop by the police, which is a workshop that we designed, we copyrighted, and we've done all over the country. Her family was angry with her, the mother, um, Emma Jones, for inviting me into that home knowing I was a police officer. They were livid with her. Now she's the one who lost the child, but that's how they felt. Now it took some time to build a relationship with her family. And I have a family, a relationship now with her daughter, Tracy and the whole family. And I'm saying that to you from the perspective that I understood their anger. Their righteous indignation made sense to me because their loved one had been killed by a cop and they were not making a distinction between me and him. The, the, the Supreme Court says that when police officers are spat at or, or cursed at and yelled at, it is not you personally, it is the uniform that is the symbol of the government that you represent. That's number one. And so what I often say to people who are not from those oppressed groups or those fragile communities, that you've got to develop a bit of a thick skin because as my mom used to say, you can't beat me with a stick and then tell me what hurts and how long I should cry about. Now, sometimes, and, and this ties into the work we do, people aren't ready to have that conversation. And so the problem across racial lines is that there are some people who say, well, you want me to have a very clear, generic, non-emotional, non-passionate conversation about race, incest, molestation, and abuse without me getting excited. Now, what I often say this way to lighten it up for groups, because I'm in white groups often, you must understand that if you come to this country blacker than a thousand beautiful midnights and end up with a baby like the Lacey Davis, light, bright, damn near white, somebody's putting cream in the coffee and loving it, and it wasn't just McDonald's, right? I'm loving it, right? That's the commercial. And I say that lightly because I want people to be safe but I also want to share it with them in a way. Now, what that, that expression there says is that my ancestors were molested. I delivered it that way because it didn't hurt when I said it to you. You didn't feel that sting that I see every day when I see freckles in my face because it just makes sense to me with my travel around the world that how in the world do you go from this dark to this light unless somebody comes in between? That's my reality. And that's the reality of our people even for the struggle between the black community and the Latinx community, right? So when I talk to my brothers and sisters who are Puerto Rican, I say, you are Taino and you're African. We are the same. And some of us don't know that. When I go around the world, I've gone to Europe looking at the black Madonna. So in, in Italy, the week before Christmas, they celebrate the Madonna. For those that speak Spanish, no Madonna nearer is black Madonna. I'd heard about it. I needed to see it. I traveled all over Europe. Everywhere I've been, they've got the Black Madonna. In Poland, it's Our Lady of Czechoslovakia. 
I'm going, well, if they got this black Madonna in Italy. They've got her in, in Poland. They've got her in England. I went to see her, um, um, where was I? Dublin, Ireland, okay? 165 White Friar Road in England, 129 Arlington Road. I mean, I went looking. There's a book by Ian Begg called The Occult of the Madonnas. Well, then how did I get a white guy here in America? <laughs> right, so that's pain. And that's why we talk about Sankofa, go back and fetch, return to the source. Because see, I can have a conversation with you that doesn't threaten your existence because I have, I've had enough life experience, and as we say in our business, lived experience, mm -hmm. that permits me to empathize with you before we begin to talk. It permits mm -hmm. me to understand that as a white person who may not be exposed, there may be some feelings of guilt, there may be some feelings of shame, or just not understanding and feeling attacked because I'm presenting it a certain way. So the delacy that you're getting today is not the guy that you may catch somewhere on YouTube that's at a microphone screaming and yelling in the street. Mm -hmm. So the people that know me from that person, the activist and advocate, when they see me now, they go, is this dude sick? Like, I never seen him this calm. Like, what's wrong with him? But what I recognize is the point you've made, and I'll end up my point there, is that if I'm going to be successful, I need allies in other communities, which includes white brothers and sisters, Latinx brothers and sisters, indigenous brothers and sisters, Asian brothers and sisters, and folks that haven't decided how they're going to identify, right? I need all of that. So two of my children, one is gay, one is bisexual, neither one of them identifies either of that. Right, but if I see my daughter with a daughter with a girl, I know she likes girls. And if I see my daughter with a girl and then with a guy and has a baby and back with a girl, and again, I'm not here to judge, but I got to build those relationships. So when I go talk to some LGBTQ kids at a university recently, they said, "How did you get to be that cool as a parent?" I said, "Trust me, my children worked on me. Right, I had to be open to hearing from them how they were experiencing me." So that's what we talk about in the social work field. I have 15 interns that are social workers that are with us each year. And so I learned from them, yes, we're usually, most of us are self-reflective, but many of us are not self-aware. Meaning we know how we're experiencing the world and we look back over and say, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? But self-awareness is about how other people are experiencing you. And most of us don't have the courage to find out how we're being experienced. In fact, when we have a conflict in union, my staff will tell you when someone brings it to me, I say to them, do you have the courage to hear how your colleagues are experiencing you? Not what you think of them. That's a bad question. And what I tell my team is, you can tell them that you spoke to me, and I only want one rule when you go talk to them. You get them individually so we don't have groupthink. You do it privately, and you close the door, because we have no door closed policy in my agency, open door policy, including my door, unless it's protected by privacy. And you go to them and say, I talked to Dr. Davis, and he raised this issue with me, and I disagree with him. Would you honestly tell me how you see me and explain experience me and I'm not going to give you any feedback. I'm just listening and learning. Did you hear that, Holly? That's Write it down. Create, yeah, that's right. how we create <laughs> that atmosphere, right? And so in my agency, even interns can give me feedback. I had, we were running a male mentoring program for three years and I had two interns, Andrea Marabuto, who now works for me, a Portuguese woman who identifies as white. And she's been with me three years now. She started, she did a bachelor's internship, a master's internship, and now she's a family support partner for the last two years or so. She says she and Jasmine Barboza, who's a social worker, um, um, licensed social worker who works for an agency, assistant partner, and they were interns at the time. They said, we think you're being so unfair that you do a male mentoring program every year in the summer for guys and you have nothing for girls. I said, well, thank you for bringing it to my attention, but it's not that I didn't notice it. I'm not a girl and I can't run it. I'm running male mentoring because I'm a man and I can run it for young men. She said, well, you have female staff. I said, their primary job is to do family support work. They don't have the time, nor do I have the resources. I said, so if you've identified a problem, I now name you the chairperson of the problem solvers. It is now your job to tell me what you want to do to solve the problem. And you can take as much time as you need. You've got a whole year here and tell me what you do to solve the problem that you identified. Because it's not enough to tell me there's a problem. You now must participate in solving. Guess what? She runs one of the most effective YP programs we have. They do female mentoring anywhere from six to 10 weeks. They now do a big girl group and a little girl group. And they do it year round, four times a year. And Carol Russell supervises that whole piece. The point I'm making to you, now here, we didn't have to fight. She has the right, if I say it's an open door policy, I have to be willing to be vulnerable. 
It is not enough for me to tell my staff to become comfortable being uncomfortable. It made me very uncomfortable to hear a college intern call me out in front of everyone. But it was done respectfully, and it was the truth. The truth doesn't change. As long as we tell the truth, anybody else? You can see in the comments, you're getting positive feedback of folks agreeing with uh, things you're saying. I uh, love this one. I cannot express how much I needed this presentation today. I sincerely thank you for sharing your time with us. Uh, wow. So grateful for this lunch and learn. I, I have to ask you, I, I hear you speaking and I am so moved and so motivated that I want, I want to hear others, but I know how long it takes to get to the point. And thank you for being honest about that, how, how much counseling and experience and support I mean, I just feel like we need that on our leaders. Would we you ever do. run for office? No. I, listen, so that's probably the last. You have thing. my vote. I'll run your campaign. Yes. And, you know, folks ask me all the time, would you run for? I said, no, because I like to say things that are not politically correct. Right. So mm -hmm. if I meet a police officer that I think is a Negro, I need to call him that. And that's just not cool. So and, you know, I want to tell people, for example, I got put out the union for saying that the Organization of Culture of Law Enforcement is white male dominant, racist, sexist, homophobic. And then you might find good cops. It put me out the union for that. But I meant it. Right. And I said that while on the police force, because at the end of the day, 